Please welcome Dr. Eliezer Gonzalez. Well, my topic for this afternoon is how to be holy. Years ago, I would have gone to town on this topic, maybe in a different way to what I will today. But I want to start at the beginning. Ever since I was very young, I've always wanted more. In my life, I've yearned for more. In some way, I haven't been satisfied. There's something that's needed to be filled. My, er my earliest memory is being rushed to hospital in the dead of night because I, I had terrible kidney infections as a, as a very young infant when I was one, two years old. Up, yeah, And uh, raging temperatures. Very ill, the doctors didn't think I would survive. And one of my very earliest memories is I was in some sort of an isolation uh, room in the hospital, uh, screaming for my mother. There was no window out. Oh, there was only a tiny window in the door. Uh, and I could see my mother's face looking in. And I would scream at that window. I was learning that Satisfaction in life is a hard thing to come by. At school, I wanted to have friends. When I started school, I thought this would be a, a great opportunity to make friends. Even though I'm told by those who love me nearest and dearest and know me best that I talk far too much, the reality is that uh, I consider to me, me, myself to be extremely shy and I'm very introverted. I process, process everything internally. I, I take everything to heart. It became very difficult for me to make friends. I didn't have friends at school at all. There was a yearning in me that wasn't satisfied. Friends didn't do it. I always wanted to have a bike. Which kid doesn't? I was never allowed to have a bike as a child uh, because they were far too dangerous. So I never had a bike. That yearning went unfilled. I quickly realised at school though that I could get, I could get really good grades in actually early on in all the subjects. And so I made it my goal to become the very best student that I could. And so, you know, some reports as an infant and as a child, you know, I'd, I'd get straight A's. And I thought that that might, might make me satisfied and fulfil the yearning within me. It didn't really. Then I thought I'd, be, I'd become the best behaved child at school. I'd be the one who would get all the stickers and, and the special rewards and all those sorts of things. And I mean, I was pretty much a goody goody. I mean, you know, I mean, but what I found is I remember there was this teacher in grade six. I won't say his name, Mr. M, although I'm sure he's long gone now. But I remember that he always used to give the rewards to the cute little girls. Looking back now, it's a bit disturbing. You know, even though I knew that I had behaved a lot better. And so being the best behaved person in, in the class didn't end up being satisfactory for me. Then I started to learn the violin and I threw myself into music and I loved music with a passion. It fulfilled many, uh, many emotional uh, aspects of my being. I loved that. But it, it wasn't what I was ultimately looking for. And as I began to become a little bit older and being religiously inclined, I decided that I would become very good at understanding the Bible. So I threw myself into studying the Bible from a very early age. And um, in learning, I, at least I'll say, I far outstripped my peers in, in that department. But just understanding the Bible didn't seem to... Satisfy. So I decided to become the most spiritual person that I could be. And so I adopted all the various spiritual disciplines. I tried memorising scripture because, you know, that's, that's good and it's, it improves your memory and it's good for you spiritually. Then you can just you know, spit out the verses and they'll come to mind if you memorise scripture. Well, anyone who knows me and it knows that... Uh, Memory is not my strongest point. And uh, the best I got to was I did, re I did memorise all of John chapter 1 once, even today. Scripture comes to mind, but it's not the precise words of the King James Version. It's the Eliezer Gonzalez paraphrase. And 
Um, you know, you'll be waiting a long time sometimes if you want the precise reference. I cannot remember numbers. And I'm 49 now, so, you know, this is something, maybe a project for eternity, improving my memory. Um, but I, I would uh, I'd, I'd devote, I would do all the different spiritual disciplines that you are meant to do to become more spiritual. I would devote an hour a day to reading the Bible, meditating on the Bible, to... And, you know, I'd pray regularly. And when there was a new formula for, for prayer, you know, um, they have acronyms of different ways to pray. Well, I'd try them all. But, you know, being the most spiritual person didn't seem to satisfy this yearning I had. I didn't know what this yearning was. I thought my family might, might satisfy that. And even though I grew up in a, in a loving family, I, as I grew up, I realised that it also was a flawed family in some ways. So that didn't satisfy. And then I went into business uh, for 13 years. As I was finishing school, before I did that, well, I was all excited because I was going to change the world. You know, maybe that was my calling. Maybe that was what was going to satisfy this yearning in me. I was going to change the world. After all, I was smart. Supposedly, I was bright. It could be anything I liked. Well, eventually, I went into business. I taught for three years and I went into business for about 15 years. Did it had all sorts of roles there. Um, that didn't satisfy. Yeah, I was the big boss at times. It didn't meet that yearning. Even though people looking out would look at me and look at all my achievements, and even since then, and they say, wow, you've done all these things, da, da, da. The reality is that I grew up with a tremendous sense of worthlessness. There's reasons for that that don't need to be gone into, perhaps, as I look back. But even today, when my lovely wife says to me sometimes, and this is a terrible confession, but she, so you can see I'm being, I'm being real with you, and she says to me, I love you, the first thing that springs to my lips is why. It's shocking. It's terrible. Someone like me shouldn't say that, but it's true. I realised that business wasn't satisfying. I had some, some good successes, but overall I considered myself a failure. I lost millions of dollars for people. You know, don't invest, um, you know, uh, me if I'm starting a, 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 a new business with a brand new idea, something the word's never heard before, don't invest with me. Okay, just, just warning. There's gospel safe, though. It's the everlasting gospel. I didn't make that up. But anything I make up is, it could be dodgy. People have found that out to their loss in the past. Well, I realised eventually that um, what my heart was yearning for was something far greater than these things. It was holiness. And that holiness is a, is a universal yearning of humanity that can only be satisfied in one way by God. So what is holiness? I, well, I checked the dictionaries and all that and I kind of knew, but holiness in the Hebrew comes from a word that means to be set apart. Well, I thought, I thought you know, I mean, I, well, I wanted to be set apart, but how did that happen? In the Greek, it comes from a word, hagios, which means to be perfect, without flaw. And boy, did I, did I want to be perfect. I wanted to be without flaw because I saw the weaknesses and flaws in me. In fact, I thought that, you know, over time, all the flaws would go from my life. Looking back at 49 years of age, I've got to tell you, um, a lot of them are still there. That's just fact. So I studied how to be holy. I really did. Because Hebrews 12 says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. But after years and years and years of studying holiness and trying to practice holiness and do the things that holy people are meant to do, I realised that they were years and years of failure. Something was wrong with my quest for holiness. 
Oh, yes, I taught holiness. I taught people the things that they had to do to be holy. Something was fundamentally wrong. To understand what was wrong, we have to go back to what holiness is. And holiness is something that's actually very, very difficult to define. You can say the glib things, but it's very difficult to define. You see, holiness is the very essence of the being of God. It is not a single attribute. It is the the essence of who God is. Not a single attribute, but perhaps a sum of God's attributes. Just perhaps. Thomas Boston has said that holiness is a constellation of graces. It's not a single star that you fix on. Holiness is a constellation of graces. And uh, the North American pastor A.W. Tozer has said, holiness is the way that God is. To be holy, God does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is that he is holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of, of being other than it is. You see, because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. Holiness is not a single attribute of God. So we can talk about holy places and holy time and holy people even if you wish. But the ultimate source is God alone and everything that we consider holy apart from the being of God is but a pale reflection of God's holiness. All my trying to be holy failed. Here's why. It's a story from Isaac Newton. When he was studying the sun, he he actually stared at at an image of the sun reflected in a mirror. He stared at it for so long that he became temporarily blind. It burned his retina. And he remained for three days in a darkened room uh, until he recovered his sight. And during all that time, he says that all he could see, whether he had his eyes opened or closed, was the orb of the sun shining in front of him. And that's what it would be like, my friends, to see, to contemplate the holiness of God in its naked purity. You know, we talk about angels as being holy, you know, the holy angels. But even in the vision that the prophet Isaiah has in chapter 6, the book that bears the same name, the book of Isaiah, the angels that surround the throne as they contemplate the glory of God, their expression is focused on three words. Holy, holy, holy. And it's not because they didn't speak Hebrew or English. It's not because they ran out of words to, it's not because they didn't understand language. It's because as they contemplate with their faces the holiness of God, the only expression that can come from their lips is holy, holy, holy. You know, Bible reading didn't make me holy. Praying didn't make me holy. They were very good for me. I'm not disparaging these things, but they didn't make me holy. In fact, these things discouraged me because my focus was on holiness and doing things did not make me holy. No matter how good these things were, Understanding the prophecies did not make me holy. Debating with atheists did not make me holy. Debating with other Christians who had other views did not make me holy. I considered myself pretty good at those things, but I was far from being holy. Fasting, saying special words, praying, uh, repeating the proper prayers, giving to God, money, time, doing missionary work didn't make me holy. Do not believe the lie that there is anything that you can do, that any of these things will either make you holy, contribute to your holiness, or make you grow in holiness. It is a lie. Nothing that you can do can make you holy or to become more holy because holiness belongs to God alone. 
And even when we present the best version of ourselves to God, the holiest that we can be. It's like that story of the Baptist evangelist Frederick Meyer. He was visiting a, a Scottish uh, home uh, one day, and it was washing day. You got washing day in your homes, in there, you know, and uh, that's when the clothes get hung, they get washed, and they get hung on the line. It was washing day, and the good wife, the the housewife, had hung all her her white clothes on the line. Boy, they looked beautiful, sparkly and white. But then it began to snow, and the ground became covered with snow. The trees covered with snow, and for some reason the washing was still on the line, and Frederick Meyer uh, commented on it to this old Scottish lady, and she cried, I'm not going to do the accent by the way, she cried, Man, who can stand against God Almighty's white? Against God's almighty white, all our righteousness is like filthy, wa- filthy rags. Some good theology in, in the wives. We should listen sometimes. Yet, you know, we live and too many die with this unquenchable, un- unquenchable thirst for holiness. Why? If it's not possible for us, and every yearning of the human heart of whatever form it takes is a quest ultimately to yearning for holiness. Here's why. Because we were created for holiness. God made us for holiness and for no other purpose. To have communion with him, to speak with him, to share joys with him, to work with him. In English, the word holy, H-O-L-Y, which is what we're talking about, has the same root as the word holy, which is W-H-O-L-L-Y. And it comes from the idea that to be holy means to be complete. We learn, we, we yearn to be complete. We despair of ourselves as broken people. We give up on ever being complete. So how can we begin to understand the holiness of God for ourselves? What should I have done so many years ago that I commend for you to do? Well, here's how we can understand it. Because God brought his holiness down from heaven to this earth and clothed it in human clothes so that we could all understand it. Now, when did that happen? The Jews think that it happened at Sinai. Because they have the same, the wrong idea, the same wrong idea of high holiness that too often we have. They thought that Sinai was the greatest manifestation of the holiness of God because, well, that's where God audibly spoke with his voice and the mountain trembled and there was earthquakes and thunder and lightning and, and the sound of trumpets and the people were terrified. It must be the greatest manifestation of holiness. But that's not true. The Apostle John says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The greatest revelation of God was given in and through Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of God's revelation to humanity. Apart from him, there is nothing. You can search every religion in the world. You can search scriptures and you will never find a total, a complete manifestation of the holiness of God except in only one place, a place called Golgotha, a little rocky hill outside a gate of Jerusalem, the cross of Calvary, where God revealed his holiness to us that defines holiness. You want to study holiness? Go first to Calvary. The son recognised it because the son veiled his face and covered the earth with darkness at the holiness of the son of God that was revealed there. The earth recognised it. At the moment of Christ's death, there was a mighty earthquake. 
The non-believers recognised it in their leader of the execution squad, the centurion, who confessed, truly this man was a son of God. And even the dead recognised it because at the death of Christ, the Gospels say that the graves were open and many of the saints that slept arose from the, go- from the graves and went into the city and proclaimed Christ. Isn't it interesting that the only ones that didn't recognise Calvary as the supreme manifestation of the holiness of God were the people who claimed to be the most holy because they had a completely wrong idea. They had a completely wrong idea of the meaning of holiness. Oh, so did I. I used to think that if you didn't wear a tie at church, you weren't holy. Some of you laugh, okay. You know, and, a, and a suit, by the way, and a suit. And uh, there were certain holy ways of talking. Okay? No wonder we can't preach the gospel half the time if you're, th- if you're thinking like that. You know? And that made you holy if you talk in a certain way, if you look in a certain way, all the externals. You know, every characteristic of God's holiness shines out at Calvary like a beautiful polished diamond. The holiness of God is perfectly manifested through Christ Jesus there. He was holy from the beginning, from everlasting. He is the one of whom the angels said that he was the holy one within her womb. And he had been the Holy One of Israel from the beginning. Why did God manifest his holiness, this ultimate display of holiness in Calvary in this way? So that it might burn into our minds and into our hearts, not to cause us blindness, but not to cause us harm, but instead so that it might always be remembered penetrate deep and bring healing to us. And so the constellation of the graces of God, his holiness, is supremely manifested at Calvary. Every beautiful aspect of the character of God is manifested at Calvary in the most beautiful way. Jesus said, into your hands I commend my spirit. And there Jesus shows us his perfect trust, his perfect relationship. How many of us yearn for that perfect relationship? How many of us have experienced imperfect relationships, unholy relationships? Well, God reveals his holiness in the perfect relationship of Jesus Christ with his Father, his perfect faith, his perfect trust. Jesus says to John the Apostle, who was there at the cross beside Mary, Jesus' mother, he said, said, behold your mother. And to his mother Mary, he says, behold your son. And there Jesus reveals his tender love. I don't know. When I'm going through extremities in my life, when I'm just even stressed by the simple pressures of life, I don't reveal my tender love. He says, I thirst. And in saying I thirst, Jesus Christ is revealing his compassion for humanity because it is only because he became a man, a human being, one of us, that he subjected himself to the weaknesses of humanity the sufferings of the cross. Most crucified people on the cross died from septicemia, blood loss or or thirst, basically. They were the three reasons of death. That the Holy One could say, I thirst, is a supreme manifestation of his compassion for us. And in saying, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, He reveals his forgiveness. It's a God's definition of forgiveness is so completely different and radical to ours, even even religious people in churches, because in our understanding, you have to 
you have to confess your sin or you've got to say certain prayers or, you know, Hail Marys or, and, um, you know, uh, you've got to actually apologise, you know, ask for forgiveness and then and you've got to promise not to do it again. And then if, you re- if your forgiveness is genuine, well, you won't do it again, otherwise it was never genuine in the first place. How many people at the cross ask for forgiveness? How many? One. And he got it. <laughs> Only one. The thief beside him. And he got it. Christ asked forgiveness for all of them. To that one thief who called him Lord, Jesus said, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And in that saying, God reveals his mercy through Jesus Christ. Because if he was able to sneak into the kingdom, in fact, the gates of the kingdom were open wide for him. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. There's hope for all of us. Now, none of these things are holiness in themselves. But together, they are what holiness is all about. And there's only one place on earth where you can find holiness. And that's the cross of Jesus. And that further highlights the pathos, the desperation of Jesus' cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the truest cry of all of us who have yearned for holiness, who have desperately needed the healing of God. Of all of us who has ever sought holiness through man-made traditions and spiritual disciplines and things that we do instead of what Christ has done. because he was our representative. So what more could you want than a God who is perfectly holy, but a God who has perfectly demonstrated that holiness and who who deeply and perfectly understands the yearnings of a human heart? What more could you want? But wait, there's more. You see, you are not holy. You can never be holy. But Jesus offers his holiness to you as an entirely free gift. This is what I discovered. Not because you have prayed enough, not because you've gone to church enough, all good things, by the way, but simply because you asked for it, believing that he would be honest and faithful and give it to you just because he said he would. Because there is a final aspect of Christ's holiness that is demonstrated at Calvary that you have to get. And it's illustrated by the last thing uh, that Jesus said at Calvary. One of the final things. He said, it is finished. And that, my friend, you see, illustrates God's justice. And it tells us that what was happening at the cross was a process and that when Jesus utters those words, there's a finished atonement, a finished salvation for everyone who believes because he has, because the transaction has happened. He has taken your sins upon himself away from you so that you no longer bear them. He has died in your place and paid the penalty of those sins. So now he is free, he is entitled legally and in every sense to give you his holiness because he has paid for that right with his life. It is finished. It illustrates his justice. Ah, too many people, they hate the justice of God. Christians fear the justice of God. I love the justice of God. It's because of his justice and his righteousness that I'm saved, as much as because of his love and his mercy. You see, when Jesus cried out, it is finished, he wasn't talking about the end of his earthly life. 
He was referring to the beginning of your eternal life. That's holiness. Not the cheap and nasty versions that you've heard before. They'll lead to despair. But this is holiness. How then does Christ give you his holiness? Well, take a look at Romans 5.1. And I want to read it from uh, Young's literal translation because it is, as the name of the translation implies, literal. I like that. Um, in this case, and Romans 5.1 says, Having been declared righteous, then by faith we have peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is how you become holy. The moment that you are declared righteous, you are declared holy. It's a declaration from God. Now, you might say, well, but that, how can that be? That's trickery. That's playing with words. Just because God declares that you're holy doesn't mean that you're holy. Well, you know, I remember the words of Romans 4.17. In fact, I'll read them here. Romans 4.17. And, Jesus, and, and Paul is speaking here about precisely, in fact, 4.18, uh, the story of Abraham, the father of faith, the faithful. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God in whom ha he had faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into existence. And of course, Paul is referring to the fact that it was impossible for Abraham to have children but God granted him and Sarah fertility. He's also referring to creation when there was nothing and God declared it and it was so. Christ was born because God declared that Abraham would have a son and that through his lineage all nations would be blessed. We exist because God declared that we should exist in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. And so I have no problem by saying that if God declares me holy by the blood of Christ, I am holy. In God's reckoning, and that's all that matters, and the moment you believe, you are perfectly holy. Now, I think that some of you, if you saw the advertising of the title for today, well, you're really looking forward to this, you know, how to be holy. So you thought I was going to talk about sanctification and and what clothes to wear to church, what food you should eat and what food you shouldn't eat because some food will make you holy and other food will not make you holy. And, and uh, maybe you thought I was going to talk about Christian perfection, so, so, you know, extra holy suggestions about how to pray and um, suggestions about, you know, how to behave holy in church, how to do good, do good deeds and what church to go to because, you know, if you go to certain churches, you might be holier than others in the minds of some. I'm sorry, maybe you feel cheated and ripped off. Well, I don't apologise. I'm not going to cheapen the gospel because you're not going to become holy through any of those means. As important as some of those may be, you can only be holy when you have been declared holy by God because you have accepted the sacrifice of the Son of God. There is no other way. And if you don't believe that you are holy, really and literally, by the straight declaration of God, well, I want you to have a look at this, this text here. And this is from the New King James Version. Now, these are the um, opening words of the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you want to open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What have I just read? Well, first of all, in the New King James Version, where it says called to be saints, you'll notice that to be is in italics. In other words, they're not in the original. The translators just stuck that on. They're flagging that they've added those words. They thought it made it easy to understand. It actually just literally says in the, in the, in the Greek, 
called saints or declared saints. You see? Declared saints. And then where it says to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, that's the same word, same root word for saints. It's the word hagiatso. It's the perfect part, passive participle in the Greek, which means it's referring to something that has happened in the past. They have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. It happened at Calvary. They appropriate that sanctity, that holiness when they believe. But the perfect passive participle also means it's something that is perfectly finished and done in the past, but that that continues to influence your life in the present. Now, in other words... What do you know about the book of 1 Corinthians by Paul? What sort of a church was it? A church that you'd like to go to? If you're looking for a church at the moment, I mean, would you like to go to the church at Corinth? There was incest going on, family members having sex with uh, their, their close relatives. They're all split into different factions. Oh, I belong to Paul. Oh, I'm with Apollos. He preaches the true word. No, I'm, I'm with this person. Oh. They were taking each other to court over things that should never have become a public shame. They're in a right royal mess with the question of uh, the spiritual gifts and their understanding of that. They weren't even celebrating the Lord's Supper properly. Why do you think Paul wrote the whole book? You know, it's, that's the topics he deals with. Yet in the very first verses, he calls them saints. Get your head around that. Maybe he didn't mean them all. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Okay. But he's certainly talking to, he writes this epistle to the saints who have been declared holy by God. Now, you've heard the expression, fake it till you make it. Is that what we're talking about here? Fake it till you make it? No, it doesn't apply here. No one will fake it into the kingdom. That's what I used to do pretending that all is well with the external stuff while they furiously struggle to make it themselves. There's no fakery. No fakes will enter the kingdom of God. But here is an expression that does apply. This is the challenge of the Christian calling. Live as if it is true. No matter how you feel, no matter how you fall, how often you you fail the Lord, You must get up again and you must live as if it is true. Why? Because it is. That's the gospel. So what about sanctification and the victory over sin and all those things? I I was an expert on all that. What about all those things? You know, that's what too many Christians focus on as the path to holiness. Well, what about those things? Well, of course, the Spirit of God will work upon the lives of his people who have accepted his holiness by faith. Of course, God will work in their lives to bring about the fruits of holiness in their lives. Of course, he will. And of course, it's very important. But aren't you happy just to trust God with that? Aren't you Happy that he will do it in his own way and in his own time? Aren't you happy to submit to God as a lamb, to listen to his voice as he directs you what path you should go and what you should do, submit to him and commit to following in obedience whatever he wants in your life? Isn't that enough? Holiness without fruit is, is no holiness. You know, oh, no, you know, Ellie is talking about holiness without fruit. I'm not. That's the old Ellie, which is all about externals, trying to get the fruit without being holy. You've heard Des say, you cannot, you must be good before you can do good. You must be holy because before you can, you can do works of fruits of holiness. Where must our focus be then? You see, God doesn't need your suggestions about holiness. He's the expert on holy. He doesn't need your suggestions about how to pray. 
He's taught us how to pray. He doesn't need your suggestions about spiritual disciplines and meditation and missionary work and doing good deeds. He doesn't need them. He doesn't even need your strength, your courage, your self-discipline. When we equate holiness with externals, we completely lose what it is to be a, a Christian, to follow Christ, the meaning of true holiness. There's this story of, uh, of a church leader who was teaching a class of boys in, in church school, you know, and, um, and he, was, uh, he thought he was doing all the Christian things and he was dressed up to the nines and he thought he was a great example. And he was trying to impress upon the, these boys the importance of living a Christian life. And so he said to the boys as he straightened his tie, Now, boys, why do people call me a Christian? And uh, one of the boys said to him, Maybe it's because they don't know you. <laughs> Oswald Chambers has said a couple of really interesting things about holiness. One of them is that the holiest person is the one who is most conscious of what sin is. Think about it. And the second one is that the holy man or woman, is the most humble person that you will ever meet. That's Christ's example at Calvary. C.S. Lewis said, How little people know when they think that holiness is dull. True holiness is irresistible. Calvary is irresistible. The gospel that says that holiness is through the cross alone is irresistible. I want to show you just how irresistible. I want to finish by reading Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 10. Now, I'm just going to read this from the message, which is a kind of a paraphrase. But I want to do that because I want to really capture the, I want to capture the passion be behind these words. Often in a lot of the translations, it's, they're just stayed translations. But these, these words were written with passion. I think this, uh, this captures it well. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 10. Look at how irresistible true holiness is. How blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down the earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. And what pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Before I keep going, I just want to just, just note that how how Paul says that God in Christ takes us to the higher places of blessing and that the Christian life is a celebration of God's lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Is that what the Christian life is for you? That's true holiness. I'll keep going from verse 7. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, were a free people free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need. Just consider that. On the plans he took such delight in making, he set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven everything on planet Earth. And so, my friends, may everything in your life, even your holiness, be summed up in Christ. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.